Hey, what's up guys? How are you all doing? I'm doing pretty good myself. So anyway, do you remember a bit of Orange? Yeah, that guy responded to him multiple times and he made a response back to me and then I responded back. And then he came up with a video that was supposed to roast me, which was just an 8 minute rock and roll video. Yeah, that guy. I was going to never respond to another one of his videos again, but now I just can't resist. He has a video here titled, The Epic Evolution Fail Slideshow, where he briefly goes over some of his points on why evolution is false. So that's what today's video is going to be about. Before we begin, however, I wanted to give some time to mention today's sponsor, NordVPN. Nord is an encryption service that hosts over 4,000 servers in 62 countries. Ever wanted to feel safe while surfing the internet? Ever wanted to watch videos and visit websites exclusive to other countries? NordVPN will allow you to do just that using its double data military grade encryption. I myself will be traveling to another country in the next month or so, and I will be using Nord to give me activity for quite a few websites based in the United States, such as YouTube itself. If you're interested, be sure to go to nordvpn.org slash stick and use the coupon code stick to get 77% off for the three year plan. Thanks for listening guys, and thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. And without further ado, let's talk about the evolution fail slideshow, shall we? In order to give rise to and grow the Darwinian tree of life, thereby accounting for all of the plant and animal kinds that exist now and which have existed in the past, evolution is an unguided natural process which increases the genetic information in an organism, creating new genes which did not previously exist. These new genes then cause an increase in physical complexity and associated behavior, both of which increases the organism's ability to survive and pass on these traits to offspring. Excellent. Excellent how you are defining evolution for us. You know, it shouldn't be the scientists or anything that should be defining these terms. No, no, no. Okay, for real though, please don't redefine scientific terms and then attempt to debunk the straw man you created. It doesn't really help anyone's case here. So let's define it for real. Evolution is simply change over time. Or if you want to be more specific, it is the change in characteristics, genes, or traits of biological populations over time. That's all it really is. This could be an increase or decrease in genetic information. If you're losing a trait, it's still evolution, as long as it's change. Now, evolution is self doesn't necessarily claim how organisms evolve, it just claims that they do. Which is why you hear me say mechanisms of evolution a lot. These are proposed methods in which organisms undergo evolution or change over time. Natural selection is a prime example, also known as Darwin's theory of evolution. Other mechanisms include mutations, genetic drift, sexual selection, etc. There are quite a few. This is a distinction creationists need to understand. A debate can't go anywhere if you don't understand the biological terminology and then redefine words to mean what you want them to mean. First, with consideration to the title of Darwin's book, we looked at natural selection. However, natural selection cannot be the origin of any species, because it only removes variation from a species. It does not add any. Yes, you are correct on this. Natural selection usually doesn't add genetic variety to a population, but then again no one claimed that it did. Natural selection simply selects out the organisms that are best suited for the environment and allow them to pass on their genes. The common procedure we like to show is that mutations introduce new traits, and natural selection selects out which traits are good. And that essentially makes this process non-random. The fact that you defined evolution as the gain of genetic information to begin with is going to make this list very awkward to go through. Next we looked at genetic drift and migration, but this mechanism is literally just moving existing things from one place to another. Migration cannot be a mechanism of evolution because it cannot cause a new species, gene, feature, or behavior to come into existence. Okay, so you're talking about migration here, and yes, that's just the disturbance of a gene pool due to members leaving and joining populations. The reason you don't really understand this is because you defined evolution wrong to begin with. Evolution describes a population, not everything as a whole. So when a population, let's say, has a bunch of members carrying a certain allele leave the group, you decrease the frequency of that allele in the population, and that itself is evolution because the gene pool has been affected or changed to some degree. And this is also a way that populations can gain genetic information, such as when a member joins the group and carries with them a trait the population didn't already have. Migration doesn't state how that new trait arose, just that it joined the population and changed the gene pool. So that's migration. You stated in the beginning of this section that this was going to be about genetic drift and migration, and it doesn't seem like you talked about genetic drift at all. Hello? Are you going to forget that genetic drift is a thing? Because it is such a popular definition of and proposed mechanism for evolution, we looked at changes in allele frequency. However, changes in allele frequency cannot be evolution, as they cannot create new genes, variations, or species. Changes in allele frequency isn't a mechanism of evolution, it's a result that could happen due to other mechanisms. If natural selection selects out an allele, that's a change in allele frequency. If mutations introduce a new allele, that's also a change in frequency. You get what I'm getting at here? It's not a mechanism itself, but rather it's a result that could happen. And since changing allele frequency would mean changing the gene pool, that itself is under the umbrella of evolution.
The ultimate failure of this proposed mechanism is that it is a statistical change, not a genetic one. This is mere census information and cannot be evolution, nor even a mechanism of evolution. First of all, no one is claiming that it's even a mechanism of evolution. Second of all, it is both a statistical change and a genetic one, because we look at populations as a whole, not by the individual. And in the larger scheme of it, changing the allele frequency in a population is changing the gene pool. We looked at descent with modification. This was rejected because it is so ambiguous that it has no meaning. All this term can mean is change over time, which doesn't say enough to separate the origin of species from the extinction of a species, and thus can't be said to be evolution. Why are you assuming that scientists are claiming that these alone explain how large-scale changes occur? It's always going to be a combination of factors that ultimately cause speciation and modification. If you're looking for mechanisms that can gain function or genetic information, well, I've provided two of them already in a previous video on you. I haven't really heard a proper response from you on those, so if you have the time, please go check it out. We looked at vestigial organs and structures and found that while they are listed on most textbooks and websites intending to promote evolution, these are literally the evidence of the loss of structures and functions, which is the exact opposite of what Darwinian evolution is intending to explain. No, loss of function is still evolution. And now what, have you jumped from mechanisms of evolution to evidence of evolution? Because that's quite different. Vestigial organs tell us a lot about the ancestors of those organisms. A limb or organ that is useless today may not have been useless in the past. It shows that evolution has indeed occurred. It'd be nice if you could expand your definition of evolution to accurately depict all changes, not just changes that increase function. We spent considerable time looking at the favorite mechanism for making not only new kinds of plants and animals, but comic book superheroes. Mutations. Mutations are so unlikely to create new genetic information, and so much more likely to cause damage to existing genes, that the creation of a new gene by mutations is essentially impossible. Finally, we're getting to the juicier topic. Now, as you guys know, mutations don't just involve changes in nucleotides. This is a way to say all errors that occur in the genome. So translocations, for example, would fall under this umbrella. Now, the quote you presented here is somewhat correct. The majority of mutations are silent, meaning they don't change anything in terms of the expression of the resulted protein. Out of the non-silent mutations, yes, most of them are harmful. But now here's the thing. You've been presenting these mechanisms of evolution individually. It's important to know that all of them act together in unison, which means, you guessed it, natural selection is involved. Once mutations occur, natural selection selects out the beneficial ones to stay, while the deleterious ones are removed from the gene pool. No matter how unlikely it is for a good mutation to arise, once it does, it will likely be there to stay. Now, in reality, not all beneficial mutations may spread to the entire population. There's actually a mathematical formula for this, but you have to understand how many mutations actually do occur. Beneficial ones may be less likely than a harmful one, but it will be favored out by natural selection. Election. We've never seen a beneficial mutation which adds information to a genome. You know, Orange, I did give you two solid examples that you responded poorly to. I'd like to see you address them again. After we'd examined all of the proposed mechanisms of evolution, we looked at more alleged evidence for evolution, starting with fossils. The problem we discovered is that the fossils are not found in the Darwinian order, and have to be arranged that way according to evolutionary theory. You know, that's something I've heard creationists say a lot, and it's become a false rumor that has spread throughout the creationist community. Let's just put it this way, it's not true. Scientists built the evolutionary tree in part due to the fossil evidence. If they found even one fossil that wasn't where it's supposed to be, they would have to rewrite the entire tree. But alas, that hasn't happened. I suggest spending less time on creationist websites and more on actual scientific websites that detail how we know what we know. Okay, I'm going to start powering through the rest of the video quickly, since they're mostly arguments we've heard before. The ages of the rocks and the fossils are based on circular reasoning, wherein the rocks date the fossils, and the fossils date the rocks, and the entire enterprise once again requires you to accept evolutionary theory as fact before you begin the process. Not true. Rocks can date the fossils. The fossils also date themselves. Radioactive dating is a very useful tool that allows scientists to give a good estimate on the ages of fossils. It has tremendous accuracy, and is cross-checked by other forms of dating as well. Even worse, the fossils show no transitional forms, thus showing no evolution happening, even if the deep time evolutionary dates are accepted. Okay, first of all, everything currently, now and in the fossil record, are transitional. There's no end goal. Organisms are constantly evolving to something different. Second of all, I guess you're just going to ignore fossils like the Tiktaalik, which shows the early stages of fish during their transition out of water. The next bit of alleged evidence for evolution was molecular clocks. Some people try to claim that DNA changes at a constant and predictable rate, but this was shown to be false for several reasons. A lot of it is predictable, yes, but no one is claiming it's that easy. There are so many other factors to consider. In addition, molecular clocks are not an independent method of dating. They are always cross-checked with other methods and are more useful in determining ancestry. The biggest objection, in my humble opinion, is the fossil record. Evolutionary theory states that the fossil record shows species living on Earth unchanged 
for hundreds of millions of years. But clearly, if that were possible, it would prove that DNA does not change at regular and predictable rates. Molecular clocks are based on the rate of mutations, not the rate of evolution. You could have plenty of mutations, but the species could stay relatively the same. For example, if an organism is in the environment that stays static, it does not need to evolve to further adapt to any changing environments. Mutations will still occur. They will always be there. But natural selection won't select out any significant mutations because the organism has already adapted fine to the environment, and there are no evolutionary pressures involved. Anyway, this is going to do it for now. He talks a little bit about homologous structures at the end, but I've already talked about this a lot so I'm not going to do it again. Before I go, I wanted to give another thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. The link is in the description if you want to check them out. Okay, bye.